This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Hello, and welcome to Bewilderbeasts. I'm your host, Melissa McKee McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Today in Bewilderbeasts, we are going to talk about how a father's unimaginable loss has been channeled into saving the monarch butterfly, how a group of endangered California condors has Airbnb'd a woman's house with her still in it, and how highway overpasses are changing the game for migrating animals, and that maybe my city outside of Boston, Massachusetts can take a page out of that book. Hopefully. Okay, let's go. This is my last episode until September. It has been a really fun project for me to investigate all of these unusual ways in which animals intersect at humanity. There were lots of surprises, things I just didn't expect at all when I took this project on back in September of 2020. And I want you to think back as to what some of your favorite moments are. This is not going to be a clip show. That's not what this is. We are going to have new content today. I discussed that in the intro, but I just want you to think about, like, what didn't you know going into this show that you now think about today? For me, the surprises were more about the historical stories. The things I know I didn't really learn in history classes and I had learned about in these big historical deep dives in the context of animals. I think I would have done way better in my history classes, truthfully, or looked forward to them more. Memorizing dates and timelines, it's just not fun, at least not to me. But putting things in a context in order to make learning fun and tangible would have been wonderful. How could that have happened in my high school years? Well, in the immortal words of Portlandia, quote, put a bird on it. I would have been all in. But truthfully, the biggest surprise when I think about everything that we've covered was the Border Collie who inherited $5 million. I thought that story was just going to be a fluffy, fluffy piece on animals who inherited money from the owners who died, but instead, it turned out taking a sharp left turn into certainly the darkest story that we have covered on this show about racism and the formation of the KKK and how a current statue to an absolutely evil figure in American history that I for sure had never heard about How that tied into a cute dog who got money from her dead owner. I think that was the one that just took me by surprise the most. And while that story was dark and unexpected, it felt right to cover it in the context of what was going on culturally in America at the time that I told that story. During the heat of Black Lives Matter, which I hope is a movement that continues moving forward and with the support of white people now that we you know, are going back to normal, and I hope we really don't. I hope we learn a lot of lessons from the last year. Um, And quite frankly, the thing that really bothers me the most about this period today in history is that in the rush to go back to normal, certain people are afforded the opportunity to do that and to not be paying attention as much to culturally what's going on, historically what's happened to lead to some of these pivotal moments that have happened in the last year. And for some people to be able to just walk away and forget all of that and all of the signs in yards and all of the Etsy support that they could that they could purchase to say, I'm a good person. Um, I think, as we'll see throughout today's stories, that action matters more than anything. And I think that that's really going to be the core of today's story. It doesn't It doesn't tie all three stories together, but action speaks louder than words. And I hope that going through the summer that you guys can find ways to take action in a way that is meaningful to you, whether it's to help people, help animals, make a change for 
an animal or a human in your life um, and, and just really think about how your actions can help people, not just the words that you say or the t-shirts you wear. And that story about the border collie inheriting all that money really brought that idea and that concept to the fore in a way that I had never really thought about. And especially in the time that we did that story, it that's the one I think that sticks with me the most. That and the newfie who contributed to Napoleon Bonaparte's missing body parts. I mean, that was more of a fun surprise. I mean, more of a fun surprise for me and hopefully for you, the listener. Less so for Mr. Bonaparte and his parted bones. But thinking back, we learned about so much in these last few months. Sea slugs who self-decapitate and regrow their bodies. Horses who can read. All sorts of animals who have saved people in many, many, many ways. Bees who detect landmines. Seals who live with humans. Houses of snot that can clean up the ocean. Animals who contribute to medical science. What's up, Jim the cart horse and horseshoe crabs? Animals who solved crimes. And those who contributed to crime too. Canuck the crow and more. It has been a fun nine months, and this show existing has got me through the COVID-19 crisis in a way that I did not expect, and I'm so glad that this this medium of being able to speak into a microphone from my tiny, tiny closet exists. And I know that a lot of people started boob podcasting and other projects during 2020 when we were so socially isolated from each other, but now like Disney woodland critters, we're just starting to peek out. Come out, come out, wherever you are, Disney don't sue me. We're coming out all skittish-like and we're trying to figure out the new normal while trying to get back to normal. And I hope normal is a word that we can abolish in 2021. But before we break for summer, I would like to remind you that this show is not going anywhere. It will be back in September. I will be back in September with all new animals in the news, animals in science, new animals, new ways animals intersect at humanity. And the show might look different. I might do a different format. I might just do deep dives. I might just do like fluffy stories from time to time or maybe like one-off episodes that are just funny stories and then a deep dive twice a month. You can send me your input, what you would like to hear when we come back in September, because yes, this is for me to do. This is creative for me. But without you, the listener, there's no there's no show if it's not for the one to two hundred of you that log in every week and download these episodes and listen and send me these great articles and these great pieces. So before we dive into summer break, we do still have one more show to do, and that's this one. And all of those other episodes are still alive right where you got this episode. So go back and listen or re-listen. See what you can learn or see if there are pieces of stories that you never thought about before and you can think about in a new way. Follow your curiosity. Dive deep into these stories with me. They live at bewilderbeespod.com or in whatever podcast feed you like. They are there for you all summer and beyond. And... There will be surprises throughout the summer, so subscribe and watch the feeds. So for the last time until next time, let's do this. I've never seen a butterfly stay that long. That's a quote from Frank O'Donnell about a monarch butterfly. This particular butterfly came at the right time for him to notice the unmistakable blaze of orange with black patterns on the fluttering wings, and this butterfly connected with Frank O'Donnell in the aftermath of the most tragic thing that could happen to a parent. It's the thing that scares me honestly the most about being a mom. And for the grown-ups out there with kids in their lives, it's the thing that undoubtedly scares them the most too. Every time our kids say, I'll be back, or I'll be fine, mom, while Frank's 15-year-old daughter was in a minivan with her sister and friends on the way to the beach when a tire blew out. An accident like this affects about 75,000 drivers every year in the United States, and about 400 of those thousands and thousands of accidents from a tire suddenly losing pressure result in a death when the car crashes into something else. And that's what happened to Carrie O'Donnell. A normal day, the promise of a beach, we'll be fine and an unforgettable accident.
In the week after the funeral, Frank was doing what many of us do when we are faced with unimaginable grief. We try to go through the motions. And Frank was out back tossing a ball for his dog. Toss. Fetch. Maybe wipe slobber off on a shirt. Toss. Fetch. Wipe the slobber. Think of Carrie. Maybe look around the property without really focusing on anything. Mindlessly toss. Fetch. Wipe. All while thinking. Toss. Fetch. Get hypnotized by an orange flutter. Think. Toss. Fetch. Look at the orange flutter. Think. Orange is one of Carrie's favorite colors. And then something in the fuzz came into focus. I've never seen a butterfly stay that long. In the rush of the day-to-day, we might not notice how long butterflies sit or stay. We are moving. We are go, go, go. Soccer practice. Cook. Pay a bill. Answer a text. Call mom. Oh no, I forgot to preheat the oven. But in grief, where... And I'm only speaking for myself here. I have not spoken to Frank O'Donnell, and I'm not an expert in grief. But for me, after my stepfather died, suddenly it was impossible to focus on the big things in the fog of tragedy. But the little things I could just stare at and fixate for far too long. Notice things I didn't notice before, because looking up from those little things meant that I had to face bigger things that I just couldn't face yet. And while he'll say that he's not superstitious, Frank O'Donnell said that he kept thinking that it felt like she was there while he was looking at this orange butterfly staying too long. And this isn't an unusual feeling or thought. A quick zip to the Googles will net thousands of hits, some from psychics and mystics and those who put their faith in symbols and dreams. Others are Pinterest boards and tattoo shops, but for those who find meaning in butterflies, they seem to relate back to the idea of transition, change, or rebirth. And when one appears, as many suggest, it's the universe or God or whoever or our loved ones themselves trying to communicate back to us. But I'm still thinking of transformation and change and transition. And we'll come back to that idea of symbolism later in this story. But let's get back to Frank. After his butterfly visit, he decided to plant a garden with plants meant to encourage more butterflies. His friends had suggested that this would be a great way to honor Carrie in the backyard of his home. A place to sit and think and maybe tend to life. A place to welcome more life like these butterflies. Maybe he'll even see his butterfly friend again. The butterfly who reminded him of Carrie, right there in Carrie's memorial garden. It felt right. So as Kevin Costner famously said, if you build it, they will come. And come they did. But not before a blue jay sat in a tree and cursed out Frank. Because birds. He took this as a sign, too, as the perky, bossy bird reminded Frank of his daughter. She loved the stage to dance, to sing, to be the center of attention from a young age. Something that she shared with Frank, who's a local comedian. So Frank O'Donnell decided to make room for the Blue Jays, too. And he set up a bird feeder in Carrie's garden. And as birds do, they showed up. But while the Blue Jays made him think of Carrie, the monarch butterflies were different. Other butterflies, other birds, all of the life, the flittering, the fluttering, the activity by the feeders, by the flowers, they were lovely and they created a sense of peace, but it was the orange and black monarchs that were what connected Frank most to Carrie's memory. They are truly symbolic of nature's strength and fragility, beauty, and a delicate power. They only live for a few weeks, that's how insects do. And despite these delicate wings, that short lifespan, the specific diet that they need to survive against all odds, they traverse the country 3,000 miles just to get to a volcanic mountain range in Mexico every single year. 80% of those millions of butterflies meet in four core groups in this impossibly hard volcano range, where they basically have the largest family reunion ever, breed, rest up, and then just do it again the next year. But there's a responsibility that we need to note here too. These butterflies are in trouble. The monarch butterfly is nearing extinction. And these beautiful touchstones of loved ones who have departed, personal transitions and change, these fascinating migratory insects that college kids get tattooed on their lower back all over this great country are going extinct. In fact, they qualify as a federally endangered species, but the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service decided last year against adding them to the list. It said that there were too many other species that needed protection more. And I disagree. 
They need the protection just as much, and as pollinators, perhaps more for our own survival. Because without pollinators, there is no food for us to eat. There are no flowers to grow, no fruit to chew, no grain for cows to eat, or corn for chickens to peck. Without pollinators, these fragile yet determined building blocks of life, there's no foundation on which we all stand. And as Frank O'Donnell was learning more and more about this delicate balance of life, about how much trouble these butterflies are in, he decided he was going to do more than just watch the visiting monarchs in his backyard passively. He was compelled to do something actively to help. First, he planted milkweed. This is the only food a monarch caterpillar can eat. It's so important to the monarchs that they are also called the milkweed butterfly. It's not nearly as beautiful or mysterious of a name, but it does make a good point. After the milkweed he planted was stable, he reached out to Monarch Watch, a conservation and education program at the University of Kansas. There will be a link in the show notes and on socials. Frank did everything to keep the 36 monarch larvae sent from Monarch Watch and the four that he found on the milkweed in Carrie's garden safe and thriving. Frank built a mesh enclosure in his shed to keep the larva from getting eaten by visiting birds, and he fed the babies by hand stalks of milkweed from his garden. As the larva grew bigger, eventually into caterpillars, they turned into chrysalises, and all during this process, Frank had a picture of Carrie by the enclosure, watching over the butterflies as they seemed to watch over Frank. And after a few weeks, 27 of the 40 butterfly larvae survived and became fully functional butterflies that were released into Carrie's garden, where they continued to eat and get strong, pollinate, do butterfly things, and then one day, poof, they were gone. Off on their 3,000-mile journey to a volcanic range in another country. But what they left behind were the milkweed pods, and in those pods were seeds. You could just toss them into the compost or leaf bag for your yard waste, send them along to the dump. I think that's what many people would do. But Frank saw something else. By learning about these insects, by connecting with these insects, by putting the effort to help these insects, he realized these seeds grow the only food these baby butterflies can eat. And one of the keys to their very survival lay in these pods. So Frank O'Donnell had an idea. He offered to send these milkweed seeds, seeds from his daughter's memorial garden, to anyone who wants it in the country. And he has. He has gotten notes and requests from all over the United States and Canada for Carrie's seeds. He said, I'm not saving the world, but I don't want to see these monarch butterflies disappear. Their population is dwindling, but... The more milkweed that's out there, I'd say the odds are good that we can help them. And if the seeds from his daughter's garden can help the butterflies who helped him through this dark time, the butterflies who brought a little light into his life in an impossible moment as these seeds sprout all over the country helping the butterflies in return for her memory, well, that would be a nice ending to this tale, wouldn't it? But this tale isn't over. It's not over yet for the monarch. And before we break for summer, I want you all to think for a minute on this idea of symbolism. There are those who say that butterflies are signs of communication from those we have lost, who have gone to the great beyond, and that's a lovely thought. It's something to think about. Maybe there's something to it. But while thinking of the other accepted meaning from, again, Google, so take it with a grain of salt, that these creatures symbolize transformation and change and rebirth. And I think we'd all be hard-pressed to find a better example of transformation than that in the story of Frank O'Donnell himself, a man who is on a mission to save what is arguably the most recognizable of all the butterflies on the east coast of the United States, the most recognizable but the most in need of help, the most in need of support, the most in need, full stop. The most in need of us all to rethink our choices to use pesticides, mow down their food because it's ugly, and crush the environment in which these delicate fluttering beacons of magic require. And yet they fly on. On and on to Mexico, 3,000 miles, an orange band that has so many butterflies that meteorologists can pick up their unified flight on radar as they move across the states. Flyover states, as every state's a flyover state when you're a butterfly— each flap another flutter towards the impossible, breeding grounds near volcanic mountains. And next year, they will do it again. And the next year. And the next year. And the next. 
but there are animals and species who need help more. So while technically we could support efforts to help, we aren't. And wouldn't it be nice if instead of just noticing, oh look a butterfly, pretty, and get some sort of sense of personal self and joy, what if we found an active way to give back? It wouldn't take much to transition some of the grounds back to butterfly feeding areas so they can continue on their journey. Transform the ground for good? Instead of symbols and signs, maybe get our hands dirty and help these butterflies going through a literal rebirth as they turn from a caterpillar into goo and emerge as a butterfly. A butterfly who remembers turning into goo, but that's a whole other conversation. Could we find a way to be active to help these butterflies that are clearly so meaningful to us humans on so many levels? Again, college girls, lower backs, ankles. Frank O'Donnell said that he will never stop thinking of Carrie, that this project is a way to keep her alive. He said that grief creates a hole that's always there. Sometimes it's small, sometimes it's big. It's kind of like your iris. When there's a lot of light around, it goes small, but it's still there. It never shuts. And when it gets dark, it's wide open. It never, ever goes away. He said they brought color to the garden when there was no other color anywhere else. If you would like to help monarch butterflies with the seeds from Carrie's garden, you can send a note to frankodonnellcomedy at gmail.com. There will be a link in the show notes. I will personally be reaching out, and I hope you do too. It's worth noting that the Carrie Ann O'Donnell Memorial Fund, which gives scholarships for children to study performing arts, has a monarch in the logo. Have you ever seen a condor? They are one of the most endangered birds on the planet. Most would not describe them as cute, but I'm not most. I think they look like a bird version of an old woman in the 1920s with pointed facial features, hair tufts coming out of skin where a younger woman might pluck it, expressive eyes, and as they are a vulture, they own their baldness with a confidence of a flapper with zero cares in the world. If they had fingers and thumbs, they for sure would have a long stick thing that holds a cigarette at the end, the black feather boa donning her neck, that helps too. She's absolutely listening to CD jazz with a slow saxophone. I mean... That's how I see them. Others might just say giant bird, ugly, bald head. They have a nine foot wingspan, and that's one and a third the length of a king size bed, a third the length of a London bus. What's up, England? And it's one and a fifth the height of Shaq. You know, Shaquille O'Neal, their wingspan is bigger than Shaq. So, you wouldn't think if they were that large that they would go unnoticed, and for one woman, they are definitely not going unnoticed. We'll get to her in a minute. But these condors once lived all over North America since before the Ice Age. They ate deceased beasts like mammoths and things of the like. Likely smaller animals, too. Vultures are not picky. But that's why they're so awesome at dinner parties. But as the larger animals like the mammoth died out, so did the range of the condor. Then the humans came doing what humans do, take over the land and not really give much thought to those who went before. So by 1982, I was one year old. So in my lifetime, there was a time that there was only 23 condors alive. 23. Today, there are around 160 of these flying creatures. It's a comeback but I wouldn't say they're out of the woods yet. And about 15 of these 160 have decided to be the worst air, bird, and bee guests ever. They rolled in unannounced because, well, birds, and thought, hey, that railing looks like a nice place to perch and poop on. And perch and poop on that porch they did. Then they invited friends. Apparently, Cinda Mickle's house is located in an historic condor habitat. Maybe they just wanted to check in on their roots, take in historical tours, see Grandma Condor's old stomping grounds, connect with nature, get a lower back butterfly tattoo, poop on some lawn furniture, trash the patio, destroy plastic everything, 
It's like if Spinal Tap decided to swing by for the weekend on your deck. It's not great. Luckily, no one was hurt, and Cinda apparently likes having the birds nearby. Just over there. In the trees. Not pooping on her deck. And I can't argue with that. Insult the comic dog would have a few things to say about these condors for sure. But overall, the condors are making a comeback, and we can coexist. It just might be time to rent out the house for nature photographers and wildlife enthusiasts and use that money to put alternative perches for the birds in the woods near the tree line to encourage them to go over there. For more on condors and their comeback, I cannot hype this book enough. Condor Comeback by Cy Montgomery. Oh, is that name familiar? The Soul of an Octopus Ring a Bell? It was a bestseller in recent history, also by Cy. These books are absolutely incredible. The photography by Tia Strombeck is breathtaking. Please feel free to check out their websites, cymontgomery.com and tianimal, T-I-A-N-I-M-A-L.com. Condor Comeback was a gift this year for my daughter from a friend, and Tia's photography will take your breath away. This whole series was devoted to the idea of how humans and animals intersect. In fact, the tagline for this podcast is Animals Intersecting at Humanity. And for my last story before summer break, my last story of season one, I'm going to be talking about literal intersections. Tonight on the day that I record this, I'm going to a rally in my city of Somerville. Several pedestrians have been hit by vehicles, and all but one has been struck in a crosswalk. Several have passed away from their injuries or are permanently injured. One of these deaths was my friend Cheryl Richards, who died when she was struck by a car in a crosswalk two years ago. Weeks later, another man was struck also in a crosswalk a few blocks away. We cross at these two places to get my child to school, to go to get groceries, to get to the library, to go to the park. Where this is in my city, two state highways intersect. Two state highways that are consistently and constantly ignored by our state officials. And to complicate matters, there's also an interstate on-ramp and an off-ramp that merges into these two busy, busy roads near these intersections, which makes traffic an absolute nightmare. In fact, while on a walk with my state representative and state senator, just to demonstrate how dangerous this stretch is, that we cannot walk out of our neighborhood without taking our lives into our hands, our few blocks are cut off completely from the rest of the city. Parks, libraries, schools, grocery stores, everything, and the sidewalks do not have curb cutouts for neighbors who have wheelchairs, or for moms pushing strollers through these horrific intersections just outside of Boston where traffic is held as a beacon of bad traffic in nearly any article on traffic ever. And during rush hour, my then seven-year-old kiddo waited patiently for the pedestrian light to turn on in front of my representative and my senator. The little white glowing figure of a stick indicated that it was safe for her to cross the street. And when the light came on for her, she pushed her bike into the intersection to cross, but then realized a little too late when the wall of cars came speeding toward her that the pedestrian light that she was looking at was actually facing 90 degrees the wrong way. And now she and her bike are standing in a crosswalk and there was nothing we adults could do. She pushed her bike back and hit the curb because there was no cutout, which is, according to the Americans with Disabilities Act, something we have discussed twice on this show in very recent history, required for wheelchairs, strollers, crutches, scooters, and kids too small to carry their big kid bike up the six inch of curb that should have had a cutout. So there she was standing like a deer in the oncoming daytime running lights as a wave of rush hour cars came around the corner and she couldn't move. The senator looked on, the representative looked on, and all I could do was scream. And luckily, One of the front cars saw a third grader with a ridiculous unicorn helmet in the bright teal mane meant to keep her safe from a fall, but probably saved her life that day, because what would you think if you saw that as a driver? And while the wave of cars started honking like the massholes they were at this driver who thankfully 
wasn't distracted, who wasn't texting and driving, unlike the dozens we saw earlier on our walk, this driver was paying attention and stopped. The car next to her also stopped a few feet before hitting my kid in a crosswalk feet from where my friend was killed because it is not safe to cross here. We were luckier than my daughter's classmate who was struck the year before heading home from school in the same area. She survived. She's fine. But she was very hurt, and her mom, like me, couldn't do anything in the moment. And the nightmares that keep them both awake at night are heartbreaking. Accidents can happen in the blink of the eye and can change everything. So we're having a rally to the lives of the people in our city in the last two years who have been hit by cars, nearly all of them on this small stretch of highway. The only way we can access our city that has been cut up and carved out and separated from all resources, benefits to being in a city, public services, schools, all of it. What's the point of being in a city if you have to drive? Walking is the point. And you cannot hear in the densest populated city in all of New England. And it's not Boston, it's Somerville, my home city, the town next door to the big mama Boston. We can have a rally with politicians and media and a city showing up and kids and survivors. We have the internet, we have Reddit threads, we have lawmakers who wanna change something or get reelected or maybe both, maybe not. Lawmakers and lobbyists who will get in the way and obstruct for obstruction's sake or for money's sake, for Pete's sake. We have a podcast where maybe a hundred people will hear about it this week. But we can at least try to do something by using our voices and often it works if there's enough attention. If only someone in charge cares enough to force something to happen and cut through the red tape. <coughs> Governor. <coughs> and yet... This is remarkably similar to the stories in recent history about animals crossing the highways, throughways, byways, parkways, all the ways that we have sliced and diced and cut up their homes, their habitats, their access to food, which is getting scarcer, and access to water, which is getting polluteder, and they have less and less usable land to be free. So to get over there, on the other side of the street, they can't have a rally, they can't push a pedestrian crossing sign, even if it's facing the right direction, they are at our mercy. And according to National Geographic, in a two-year window in one stretch of Utah, 98 deer, three moose, two elk, multiple raccoons, a cougar were all killed by cars, trucks, and other vehicles. A total of 106 animals on this small stretch of highway. It's unclear if there was a partridge or a pear tree involved. In just the United States, there are 21 threatened and endangered species whose existence is threatened by hit-by-car accidents, including key deer in Florida, bighorn sheep in California, and red-bellied turtles in Alabama. 200 people are killed every year on average in these interspecies accidents, over a million accidents a year. Hit a deer? Expect to pay eight grand in damages. A moose? What car? Oh, this pancake? With the threat of cars hitting animals growing, one to two million large animals hit by cars every single year, and animal deaths by our car habit are up by 50%. Something has to be done. And luckily, some people in charge have yelled and screamed and got media attention and were able to make changes for good for the animals. Instead of a moose getting hit on the freeway, wildlife bridges are popping up all over the globe to allow for animals to have safe access from land to other land, avoiding the streets altogether. And it turns out with barriers and fencing that guides animals to the underpasses or overpasses made just for them, car accidents with animals are down 85 to 95 percent in the vicinity of these bridges. The first of these overpasses was built in France in the 1950s, and since then, they have gained in popularity. They often look like big, wide bridges with grass, trees, and an overgrown overpass, truly, that allows for animals to pass over highways at risk of dying from a minivan. It's easier to do it right from the jump instead of going back and retrofitting or making changes to already built highways, as we are discovering in the U.S. and especially right outside my front door. It's more expensive to go back and fix these issues, too. But for highways being built right now, they are able to figure out in the planning stages where the elephants in Bhutan are going to need to cross and make those accessible passageways part of the planning. And that's the genius part of it all. And I hope you remember that one of the themes of Bewilderbeasts is 
is that help isn't helping at someone or at some creature. It's taking them where they are and seeing what their needs are to feel and to be safe and then to help if asked, or in the case of these animals, if necessary. Now, if we just built bridges that looked like people built a bridge for us, a few animals might use them, but if a town were to build a bridge to help grizzly bears cross a highway, it would look very different than a bridge to help cougars. It turns out grizzlies love open spaces where they cross, so a bridge that looks more like a wide open meadow with a nice view of the Interstate 90 below Maybe take some pictures, some selfies, steal a picnic basket, mosey on away. But cougars want narrower, smaller, more cover, less light in their crossings. A densely packed forest on a bridge. This way they can be all sneaky like, ducking from tree to tree like they're in a spy thriller. One bridge, the only bridge on Christmas Island in Australia, is for crabs. Crabs! From what I can tell in the picture, these are just normal crabs and not some mutant venomous crab that will do a murder on you and everyone and everything that you love. This bridge just facilitates migration from the rainforest to the ocean so the crabs can do crabby things. And if this bridge or island had a gift shop with a t-shirt that said, got crabs, I would a thousand percent buy that shirt, you know, to support migration. So when building safe crossings, and this goes out to my homies at MassDOT and the governor's desk, it's important to know the population you are trying to help. Listen and study what that population requires to feel and to be safe. In the case of wildlife, listening to experts about how to do this safely and to help the environment, there are amazing images and examples of these wildlife crossings that could maybe inspire revolutionary human crossings in urban centers. In the case of Somerville, Come with me and push a stroller from my front door to the grocery store. Walk a literal mile in our shoes and then figure out how to make us feel actually safe, not just on paper. We have to feel safe too. And if we can do it for crabs and cougars and bandicoots, bear, raccoon, elk, moose, endangered trout species, porcupines, turtles, elephants, pronghorn, squirrels who use rope bridges that are often taken over by cheeky cockatiels, which cracks me up to no end, yo, cows, Cows, we can move cows under highways and more. I think we can find a way to build these kind of crossings in more places, urban places, plan to have them in every fiber of new construction. And I think that we can do it for people in urban settings too. And in the case of the city of Somerville and the state of Massachusetts, we can learn from what is being done to help wildlife. True, the impetus wasn't to actually help animals, it was the cost of damage that turned the tide, the cost of insurance, the cost of cars, the cost of human death, not the animals. But helping animals has made this project stick, and it continues to take off. And while in Somerville people have been asking for safer measures for pedestrians and cyclists, half measures have been taken as a stopgap. Paint has been put down as traffic calming measures, but nothing really structural to keep these people safe. Nothing substantial, nothing that prevented my kid from nearly getting hit by oncoming traffic has been fixed. It's been over a year. And the sign is still 90 degrees the wrong way. The next crossing light up had been hit and knocked down by trucks turning right three times in a six-week window. They finally just moved the crossing sign, but it's still clearly not safe to stand there to cross the street something needs to be done. And usually it's humans doing stuff to help animals, but in this case, it could go the other way. By learning from these wildlife crossings, hopefully with this rally tonight and others like it, after the deaths in our city from cars, the paint on the road isn't enough to save our lives when we walk to school or to the local park. Living our lives around people with cars who embrace car culture, which is fine. I also have a car. But walking is better for us, the environment, and it's easier to get to school by walking than driving. In our case, we are literally cut off from the rest of our city by highways, and there's no safe way to cross unless you pray to a higher power before stepping into the crosswalk, which is not something I do. I tend to curse more like Paul the Parrot every time I cross at drivers who run at red lights or catcall me and my daughter. Ick. But maybe we can build something amazing here for people as we continue to build safe spaces for animals too. Now that's an intersection of animals at humanity I did not expect in this series. But here we are.
in my own backyard, as it were, if we had a yard. Y'all, we did it! We did season one of Bewilderbeast, 39 episodes in September 2020. I'm going to miss you guys. But stay tuned, stay subscribed, and go back and listen to old stories. Share your favorites on social media. Tell a friend. Watch social media and there will be things over the summer. Maybe a Q&A, a book review, or an interview about animals at Humanity. Totally Possum. That's P-A-W-S-O-M-E. Totally Possum Pod is still going to continue on a bi-weekly schedule and previous topics that Dr. Sipperstein, my veterinarian sister from another misser, and I have covered include pet food, which is weirdly controversial. How crash test dummies work for pets. It's jaw-droppingly horrifying and so interesting. How to tell if a television show about dog training or animal health is reputable. Uh, most aren't. And the mating habits of the Gulf Corvina. Corvina? Possum private parts are weird and much, much more. We cover a big topic every week in the animal world and from a professional standpoint, and then we wash it down with something real and absolutely not for children. So, so jump on over there if you are into a sneak peek behind the curtain as to what your veterinarian and dog trainer friends talk about when you are not in the room, or if you're a latchkey kid who has access to podcasts. But seriously, kids, not for kids. My book, Considerations for the City Dog, is still and will always be available through your local retailer or on big box sellers. So if you are considering getting a puppy or a dog, don't know if you should get a rescue dog or a purebred dog, what's up with daycare, how to find a reputable veterinarian, who to call for training or behavior problems, and more, check it out. It is not just for urban dogs, so it was written with them in mind. Lots of country pups benefit from these tips and tricks, too. And just the knowledge you get from someone who has to think outside of the box because bark it out won't work in a city because you'll get evicted can maybe help you in the country too. So check out Considerations for the City Dog wherever you get books. If you're an educator, librarian, or otherwise looking for content to keep kids engaged, hit me up. I will happily pull something together to help kids. I have a few presentations already on my YouTube channel for ideas, or I can cater something to your specific town, local animal lore, mascot, animal history, science lessons whatever you want. I'm around and I would love nothing more to help. And thanks to Zoom, I can do it anywhere in the country. If you like podcasts, may I recommend a few you might like to get you through the summer. There's always Sawbones, Medical History is Bonkers and Interesting, and had a lot of bad ideas. But it's better now, sort of. Varmints, a lovely animal podcast about animals hosted by Paul and Donna. They are awesome. And if you like facts and trivia, news stories about animals, this is for you. They have been at this for quite some time, and they are also very supportive of this show and lots of other indie operations like this, too. So go give them a listen and some love. Follow them on social media. They truly have the best animal memes. Planthropology. It's like this, but with plants and interviews. Vikram covers the weird ways in which plants influence culture, science, lore, stories, history, and more. Strange Animal Podcast, a long-time running show hosted by Kate Shaw, who has covered many interesting critters, real and imagined, with lovely stories, anecdotes, and facts. If you're a kid, you might like For the Love of Nature and Beyond Blathers. Two of those podcasts are all about animals, and those are on repeat in our house from our eight-year-old daughter. And they're actually pretty interesting for me to listen to. And especially with Beyond Blathers, I've been playing Animal Crossing, so it actually kind of ties in nicely to that. Blathers is the owl that owns the... You know what? If you play Animal Crossing, you know it. And if you don't, it's still fun. So go listen to Beyond Blathers and For the Love of Nature. If you need to get some rest, go and listen to my buddy Dustin, who has been incredibly supportive of little pods like this one. He's constantly sharing everyone's stuff on social, and he seems to be the cheerleader for the internet. And he's the guy that we need in times like these. And his show is also good. It's called Sandman Stories Presents. He will read you a bedtime story if you, like me, just can't get to sleep. And if Samuel L. Jackson's reading of Go the F to Sleep is not working, for some reason, check out Sandman Stories Presents. And lastly, I've referenced Terry Pratchett several times on this show, and while it has nothing to do with animals, it's no secret that I am a fan of Terry Pratchett's work, especially his 41-book series Discworld. 
And I guess in a way it is kind of like this show. It's fantasy intersecting at reality. It has deep thoughts buried in curiosity and humor. It is just funny. So if you're also a fan, jump in and listen to Joanna and Francine at The Truth Shall Make You Fret. It's a Discworld podcast where they dissect a book and their themes over the course of a month. And they are just such a joy to listen to. Now go get vaccinated if you can. Mask up if you can. Don't tease people for continuing to wear masks. You don't know what their situation is. For me, I'm fully vaccinated, but my eight-year-old is not vaccinated. So support those who are still masking up for any and all reasons. And if you feel better with a mask on, keep wearing it. I mean, for me, it's easier to make faces at people and curse like pull the parrot under your breath at strangers when you're wearing the mask. So you do you. And most importantly, stay curious. And with that, little beasties, I'm off for summer. All we have left to do now is the end credits. And you know how this goes. So thank you for joining me during the 2020-2021 pandemic on Bewilderbeasts. If you like this podcast, you can still share and tell all your friends. It's truly the best way to support this show. Watch the feed for bonus content, updates, etc. But regular episodes, whatever they will look like, will resume the first week of September 21. I'm going to need your help to get ideas and plan ahead for the second season of Bewilderby, so pay attention to the news, click the share button, and send them to me. I love hearing from all of you, and thank you to all who have contributed to make the show what it was this year. It makes me realize y'all are out there and listening. Want to know how to connect with the show? Don't be shy. Here's how. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, wacky animals in the news, or silly animal memes, things that you created over break, anything at all, send them into the show. There are multiple ways to send them in or let me know what you think. Email bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com, tweet at bewilderedpod, DM or voice text at bewilderbeastpod on Facebook, or lurk at bewilderbeast on Instagram. My YouTube channel also has every episode, and it should have every episode by mid-June, uploaded as a video. So if you have friends and family who are not cool with podcasts, but they like YouTube, it's not a video of me in this tiny closet. It, that would not be fun. But it is an image, and Headliner has been doing all of my videos for every single episode. So go ahead and check that out if that's a more comfortable medium for you for sharing. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath, co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club, the oldest AKC obedience club in the country, author of Considerations for the City Dog, and creator of this podcast. Now go get curious. I got today's information regarding the butterfly connection at monarchwatch.org, rootedmag.net, goodnewsnetwork.org, bostonglobe.com, firestonecompleteautocare.com, and saveourmonarchs.org. Air Bird and Bee, Cy Montgomery and Tia Strombeck, the book Condor Comeback, cymontgomery.com, tianimal.com, newyorktimes.com, mashable.com, and theguardian.com. The third story regarding intersections. My actual life trying to walk out of my neighborhood. Wildanimalsanctuary.org, nationalgeographic.com, and my favorite gallery that you need to check out visually. Link in the show notes. Allthatsinteresting.com on 25 plus underground tunnels and overpasses for animals of all kinds, including a tunnel that goes under train tracks for turtles and rope bridges for squirrels. Elephants using overpasses, y'all. Find this gallery. Allthatsinteresting.com. Search for animal bridges, wildlife crossings. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Lebowitz. Interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and continue to share with your curious friends. You know, everything every other podcast tells you to do. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you whenever you want. Just go to Bewilderbeast Pod for instant gratification. And I will see you next time. Bye.